Good morning to all uh, participants and our esteemed uh, speaker, Mr. Paul Meenan. Today we have a very interesting uh, person, uh, Mr. Paul Meenan uh, from UK, uh, to give a very nice uh, presentation on uh, the history of uh, bonding and uh, earthing. Also, he will take you through the uh, latest standards, the old standards, as well as how these uh, developments happened over a century. So, Mr. Paul Meenan is uh, uh, an electrical engineer. He is based out of UK and he is a fellow of IET, Institution of Engineer uh, Electrical Electro Technology, I think. Uh, so, he worked as the head of uh, mechanical and electrical for the UK rail operator uh, Trans uh, Trinitalia C2C. He founded the uh, E5 group, a group of passionate engineers wanting to share all their knowledge for free across uh, colleges and on social platform. You can have a look into the YouTube uh, of uh, Mr. Paul Meenan, also YouTube, uh, uh, the social media, they are sometimes called as Sparky Ninja, John Ward, etc. So you will get a lot of technical information about uh, the activities uh, of uh, Mr. Paul Meenan and his team in UK. Uh, so during his uh, spare time, he is uh, working as the chairman of uh, Electrical Safety Roundtable for Workspace uh, safe, Safety, Workplace Safety, and uh, he has won several medals, uh, uh, voluntary for his uh, voluntary work. He is a trained electrician. Uh, Mr. Paul holds multiple fellowships from engineering organizations. So. Uh, welcome, Mr. Paul Meenan, to be with us uh, for today and to have uh, you know the the one of the best webinar which is hosted uh, by in the NFE platform. We also have uh, Mr. Krish Theobald with us. Mr. Krish, uh, uh, all of you know, last two webinars which we made was uh, about RCDs and OCPDs. Uh, Mr. Krish was making those presentations. Uh, yesterday, uh, myself and Mr. Krish, we were there in uh, Gurgaon. We were having one day seminar on national electrical code of india so this uh, we expected about 80 participants but we had about 120 plus participants it was a highly successful program uh, also i would like to inform you that uh, our uh, uh, the sectional committee etd20 of bureau of indian standards uh, today is actually the world's standards day so in world standards day uh, the 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 uh, webinar about the history of uh, earthing and bonding with respect to standards it's actually a fantastic subject so yesterday our uh, etd20 got uh, uh, one of the best out of best out of uh, you know there were about 150 plus uh, technical committees in bis uh, five technical committees are uh, selected to give award as uh, the best committee and etd20 which is the committee which makes uh, National Electrical Code as well as IS 3043, IS IC 623053 uh, and uh, IS 732. So we got the award. So we are actually thrilled uh, uh, with the selection of our committee as one of the best. So without wasting my time, uh, without wasting the time, uh, we would like to invite uh, Mr. Paul Meenan. Uh, Mr. Paul, you are welcome. Please start your session. Uh, Excellent. Thank you very much, um, Gopal. Uh, let me just share my screen. Hopefully everybody can see this. Yes, perfect. Okay, excellent, great. Okay, thank you very much, um, Gopal. Thanks, Krish. Um, so welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for attending this morning. Um, my name is Paul Meenan. Uh, I won't repeat the introduction. I am a... Uh, a quite f hopefully fun and uh, kooky person. I love earthing and bonding. It's one of my favourite specialities. And today I am going to take you on a roller coaster. So today is going to be an intense day of as much information that we can give your way. And hopefully the engineers watching will be able to uh, watch back on the YouTube and break it down, analyse what we're saying, go away and validate for yourself, go away on your own research journeys. Um, so that you can greater understand this huge topic of earthing and uh, bonding. So I shall uh, I shall go forth. So yes, um, we're going to look at some of the hidden mysteries because I found in researching this, um, earthing isn't just sticking an electrode in the ground and putting a green and yellow wire to it. It's far more complex. And the word configuration I will use 
consistently through this uh, webinar but i'm going to i'm going to kind of have lots of different things in this webinar um, i'm going to introduce a brief timeline i'm going to look at some of the early references which i find fascinating and hopefully you will um, i always had the view you don't know where you're going if you don't know where you've come from so for me fundamental principles underlying understanding the history it's very important for a competent engineer to understand the journey of technology and safety i'll introduce you to the standards because nobody really taught me how many there were so i'm going to take you on a whistle stop journey through all of the uh, the uh, locations of research and additional knowledge i won't be going through any of them in detail this is about informing you so that you can get the best position to make an informed judgment when you're uh, selecting and erecting or designing your electrical installations uh, i'll do some uh, what we call in england some janet and john um some first principles of so terminology from our uk regs i will also introduce you to our uk regs we'll look at some pictures of some good and bad um i'll also talk about how our networks in the uk have some risks and maybe that could apply to the networks in india and i'm sure uh, krish will jump in and say yes paul or no paul and and put me on the right course um I'll talk about your impedances and resistances because that's that's some fundamental uh, parts of understanding earthing as a system. And we'll we'll touch a little bit on just bookending Chris's last excellent RCD webinar that he did um, uh, some months ago. So let's get straight into this. Um, let's start on a brief timeline. And what we will do is we will look back 277 years ago was one of the earliest references I can find to a term called telluric currents. Um, in modern terminology, telluric currents is earth currents. So 1746, that's the earliest I found. Um, I'm sure somebody watching will probably go, oh, no, I've got something going back even further. Well, that's one of the first documented uh, pieces of discussion on earthing uh, of uh, electrical systems. Now, fast forward, these are key dates in the UK and just on that journey of earthing and bonding. In 1871, that uh, cheeky chap with the cap, he um, formed the Society of Telegraph Engineers, which we commonly now know as the Institute of Engineering and Technology. Uh, if we fast forward a little bit more, 1872, Sir Charles William Siemens. Um, all of us watching will know Siemens products, Siemens technology, uh, major global infrastructure uh, provider, protection devices and all sorts of electrical systems. He was elected the first president of the Society of Telegraph Engineers. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, one of the first propositions in 1880 was to rename the Society of Telegraph Engineers uh, to the Society of Telegraph Engineers and Electricians. Evidently, the Society of Telegraph Engineers didn't have enough fun, so they thought they'd bring the electricians in as well. And there's the actual extract from the journals. Now, everything I'm doing in this, I have research from journals, but I'm also giving you my view and opinion. Please feel free to form your own opinion and uh, go and research this for yourself so that you can find out your own uh, hidden mysteries of our uh, our wonderful electrical industry. So one little hidden mystery that I found was this gem. Now in our, our early records, it's actually in one of the journals, it says, no doubt if the society was being started, uh, the proper title would be the Electrical Society. I absolutely love that. I wish they would have just called it the Electrical Society. It's a great phrase, but unfortunately it wasn't because that institute was on that journey already. So a little hidden mystery for you there. So going back to 1881, Sir Charles William Siemens, he introduced one of the first public electrical distributions in the UK in a place called Godalming in Surrey, as you can see from the map of the UK. And there's an actual image of it. Uh, that's not the actual bulb. And he introduced a number of street lighting. Um, didn't go very well. Um, the cables were laid in trenches. They were laid in um, sort of gutters. And there was lots of accidents and injuries. So it was that first public trial. Um, it was actually a disaster. So they went back to gas lanterns because this was the first electrical from gas lanterns. Gas lanterns have been in the UK for since the early 1900s. So little interesting fact. And then a year later, one year later, uh, the first edition of the Warren Record was published. So 141 uh, years ago, the first uh, edition or first wiring rules. And um, we'll we'll capture a few little nuggets from that in a bit. 
And if we fast forward uh, five years to 1887, they renamed the Society of Telegraph Engineers and Electricians to the Institute of Electrical Engineers. And so it stood for, for many, many years. So the IEEE, a uh, very famous term. Um, but just keeping to the subject matter, 1939 is the earliest reference I can find to an Earth-related protective device. So many years ago, uh, we used voltage-operated earth leakage devices, and this had a lot of information on geotechnical uh, impedance, resistance of soils, and really went into the subject matter of how do we look at the resistance and the quality of the ground that we're connecting our fixed installations to. Fast forward to 1992, the British Standards Institute, or the BSI, they uh, effectively uh, jointly published the wine regulations with the IEE, and it became a British standard, BS 7671. In 2006, sometime later, the Institute of Incorporated Engineers and the, the Institute of Electrical Engineers merged to create the IET. And that's what we have now, the Institute of Engineering and Technology. So it's been on, been on some journey now for a, a number of years. Um, so that's kind of some key points I just wanted to uh, throw out there just to show the journey that we in the UK have been on and and. There's also always a cascade around America and South Africa, and that knowledge doesn't stay in England. It's it's dissipated around the world. So if we look at some of the early uh, references to earthing and bonding, and this is what I find fascinating. Many, many years ago, um, there was journals published. So they would go to their wine regulations committee, like Mr. Kumar would go to and um, Krish, and they would debate stuff. But in the old days, everything was recorded. So the debates and the opinions were recorded and these are all published and they're all publicly available and that is where most of the history of early electrical engineering is fascinatingly debate and just here on the screen february the 10th um in 1881 there was a paper written on earth currents and i have found on this journey an amazing mind-blowing uh, uh journey that people went on on earth currents so there was talk in these papers of magnetic lunar uh, effects on the earth generating these telluric currents and people went off experimenting with plates in the ground all around the globe to to measure and find energy and they believed that the movement of the oceans and was affected by the moon and and obviously all this good journey of knowledge we've had um, from physicians and geotechnical engineers to understand and try and debate what earth currents are and if they're good um, again, it's there was that feeling that the energy was coming from the ground uh, because of the moon. So lots and lots of fascinating debates. I could do an entire webinar just on that. Um, one of the wonderful things on these papers, everything's published, um, is the responses from the peers. And the peers, this is a great point, where one of the, the gentlemen in the IEE said, uh, Mr. Adams has said our knowledge of the subject is very meagre. How true but how fascinating as well. Um, but he has discussed the evidence and that's what good engineering is about. It's discussing what evidence you have, inserting it with your opinion, understanding your duties to protect people and property. It's, uh, hey, it's great being an engineer. Um, just going back to 1882 when the first wiring rigs, this is an interesting bit on earthing. So this is one of the first standards of reference to earth. And I've just put the paragraph on the screen there. And it states, it cannot be too strongly urged that among the chief enemies to be guarded against are the presence of moisture as it is today and the use of earth as a part of a circuit uh, moisture leads to loss of current and destruction of conduct by electrolytic corrosion and the in injudicious use of earth as part of the circuit leads to magnify every other source of difficulty and danger which is fascinating when you consider you know there could be danger if you don't have a good earth um, you could have a rise in voltage. You may not have your protective devices um, protect you. And in 1882, uh, they went from in 1881 talking about how good earthing is and telluric currents to hmm, maybe it's not so good. So there's been a huge journey of learning there. Now, moving on to atmospheric electricity, what we lovingly call now lightning protection. So I have uh, done uh, quite a bit of reading in the journals and on the 27th of November, 1872, with Mr. Siemens in the chair, there was a paper read on lightning and lightning conductors um, by a member. And the, the narrative on the left is fascinating. In this country, not only have trees been shattered, 
cattle destroyed, public buildings struck and private houses injured. But human beings have been killed in such numbers that if tabulated, they would probably cast into the shade the massacre committed by even our railway trains. No, oh, that's what an interesting uh, analogy there, the massacre of railway trains. Um, the average number of deaths due to lightning in England previously to this year was 18, France 95. So you can see in the 18th century, there was a huge gathering of data and trying to understand things. Mr. Simmons, the well-known meteorologist for many years, devoted his attention to the subject, mentions that in two storms in June, nearly 200 separate accidents came under his own knowledge, including the death of 10 persons, an injury to 33. Upwards of 60 houses were struck, 10 or 15 were burned down, 23 horses and cattle, and 99 sheep were killed. Um, and it's kind of saying, well, if that was two months, what for the whole year? It also talks about telegraphic systems and railways and lightning strikes do cause huge atmospheric transients, which we know now in modern worlds, uh, we do put surge protection in England. Um, a lot of places we assess the risk of lightning. Um, interestingly, um, yeah, there's there's some the Escurial since its completion in 1584 in Spain has been on fire no less than seven times. 1587, 1590. And it goes through to 1872. The causes are unknown, but at least four of the fires arose from lightning. But not one lightning rod was introduced to this building. So there's some fascinating history. And uh, uh, you can see that people have gone on a journey of understanding their knowledge. Um, this, to me, is the earliest reference I can find to a lightning protection system. So it's from the same paper. And it says, I've recently had the pleasure of inspecting a plan adopted by Mr. Hyatt, of Painswick House near Stroud, Gloucestershire, by which he is succeeding in converting a two-inch wrought iron pipe used for ventilation of drains. So in England, we have cast iron drains that go above where the windows are to cross up are just above the roof, and that allows any smells from the drainage system to vent to atmosphere. So the wrought iron pipe is carried from beneath the ground, eight feet above the top of the highest chimney. It is therefore surmounted with a vane having a sharp point some inches above its centre. The vein and the point being of copper, it is also connected with the lead coating of the roof. It appears to me an excellent admirable system worthy of greater adoption. So this chap found in this house that lightning strikes were hitting that, not destroying the building, not causing fire. Henceforth, this is one of the earliest debates I can find that created what we now know to be the external straps or rods that go down the outside of buildings to protect the building. So that's kind of just some early history there. I'm going to take you into the standards now. This will be the whistle stop bit. So obviously we all are familiar with IS732. I am on a journey of competence development. I am finding these standards fascinating to read because obviously local conditions will apply around the world. Um, but they are written in the same spirit of the IEC 60634 or BSEN 60364. And we'll get on to what they all mean. Obviously, the latest document that Mr. Kumar and Krish and his teams are doing, they're looking at SP30, recent publication known as the uh, National Electrical Code of India. Um, it's uh, an interesting document. I've been reading it. It's kind of the equivalent, I suppose, to our guidance notes that we have. Um, that's kind of where I've looked and read it. But it's got some very good guidance in it as well, some interesting engineering thought. Now to introduce you to England. So we have the wiring rules, which has now become the British standard. Um, they have different colour covers every time they're reissued. And it's known as British Standard BS 7671, issued 2018 and then amended twice so far. The last one is 2022. We are due another one in two years, I believe. Yeah, 2025. So they're amended every three years. And then once they've gone through three amendments, it's a full revision of the standard um so yeah it's um it we never stop and for those who obviously work in our industry we are never stopping learning we're always improving the standards one of the key things i always say to people in england is for the electricians the engineers feedback to the committees give them your opinion does this work does this not it's so important so that's based up of exact same uh, IEC 60364. They go through the requirements of those series of standards and they integrate into one document. And this is the structure of it. It has eight parts. Uh, eighth was the more recent introduction. So it has a standard introduction with what I love to call the fundamental principles, chapter 13. If you're interested in reading it, if you read those six pages, you'll become a very au fait with the standard. 
It has obviously the definitions, the assessment of characteristics, which any good engineer should be doing. How do we protect for safety? How do we select and erect? How do we inspect and test? Um, and also look at the more uh, subtle special locations where there's more inherent risks or specific uh, protection measures we need to take. Uh, cattle, medical, uh, fairgrounds, electric vehicles. And then chapter eight is a new chapter, functional requirements. And that, that comes from the IEC 60364-8-2. So the numbering system is in line with the IECs. And that uh, basically covers energy efficiency, prosumerism, all the adoption of modern uh, battery storage and all that good stuff. So, And that's growing. That part is growing. So just to reiterate, the Warren Regulations is a joint publication from the IET and BSI. So they all sit on a committee together with various industry bodies, manufacturers and peers. But taking a stop and step back, how does all this create the Warren Regulations? Well, the IEC, International Technical Committee, they have a committee 64 and they publish IEC 60364. That then goes to CENELEC, which is the European Committee for Electrotechnical Standardization. They also have a technical committee 64, uh, and they obviously produce the harmonized documents, the BSEN 60364s, all the way down to the uh, committee JPEL, Joint Power and Electrical 64, and they produce the IET document BS 7671, 18th edition. So that's kind of the journey they go on. So if you want to know what's coming, you might want to expand the way you look at standards. So if you literally want to predict what's going in the world, there is a way of doing it. And you just got to look up and see what the changes are there. Now, Senlec is made of lots of European countries, obviously. Um, some non-European countries are actually Senlec harmonized. So that's one of the positives of the EU, that everybody's trying to work to a common standards framework. And, and more importantly, standards, I'm, I'm sure Gopal has um, said this, standards are a minimum criteria. Standards are not something you look up to and you argue with. They're a minimum criteria for you to make an engineering assessment and a judgment. And you shouldn't be able to uh, depart from those standards if you still have the same degree of safety and performance, um, because that's what competent engineers will do. Um, just to kind of put into context the journey we've been on in the UK, first edition published 1882, it had four parts, three to four pages. Now it's eight parts and 608. And I'm sure when your regulations are updated, they will grow. Technology is growing, AI, all the new technologies that are coming. We need to be informed. So, yeah, standards grow, and that's not a bad thing. And a lot of people don't like it. But if you adopt the principle of, yeah, fine, then it's it's easier to absorb that knowledge. So getting onto the earthing standards now, huge journey. As I said, 1939 was the first protective device that relied on earthing and talked about earthing. But the actual earthing standards themselves in 1965, uh, CP1013 was published by the uh, Council for Codes of Practice or the British Standards Institution. That was then updated and renumbered to BS7430, which is uh, anyone in Europe, you mentioned BS7430, they'll know what you're talking about. Well, the first edition of that after 1965 one was 1991. And then in 98, it was completely rewritten. 2011 again updated into the modern format and we're currently working off amendment one of 2015 so that's where we go to for a lot of our fundamental nitty-gritty earthing and bonding detail so a lot of the hv engineers a lot of the lightning protection engineers a lot of the earthing specialists this is their book this is what they use a lot of but as good engineers we shouldn't just limit ourselves to one standard that we will we will make mistakes we need to consider the guidance in other um, very well-educated publications from experts. So you look at BSEN 50310, which is telecoms bonding for buildings. You know, if you have data centers, a very important standard. We have guidance in Chapter 54 of BSM 671, which relates to the IEC standards. We have guidance notes specifically just on earthing and bonding. Um, if we carry on, if you want to look even further and look up, there's an IEC standard, uh, International Electrotechnical Vocabulary, and it just harmonizes and standardizes all the terminology. Now, we're not quite there yet, to be honest with you, because different standards do still use different interpretations of stuff. But as I said, if you want to know the journey you're on, uh, why don't you look around you? So in Australia, they have their own wiring rules. Uh, um, Ireland, uh, the 2020 um, IS10101. Excellent standard, really good. Uh, it's slightly ahead of where we are in the UK. 
And in my opinion, the most advanced standard um, out there is actually the NEC 70. Um, yeah, so it's NFPA 70, National Electrical Code of America. That's constantly being updated. Um, so there's, and that will filter in around the globe and people, the experts like Mr. Kumar will take the, the best parts and um, the lessons learned and the, the assessments of technology and they will uh, implement them into their next editions and discuss. And coming back home, we had 7430, but in India we have IS, Indian Standard 3034, which I have been reliably informed by Chris is our, um, our equivalent in India of 7430. And then obviously with that, you would most certainly want to take advice from Indian Standard 732, which oh, the Indian wiring regulations, and then um, SP30, your guidance and your national electrical code. So all of them will contain some fundamental uh, knowledge to make an informed judgment moving on if you're a hv expert um, lots of people are uh, bsen 50522 which is earthing of power above 1 kv and then bsen 50122 which for me who works in railways very important document there's a whole suite of these i could go on for hours I could do a whole webinar just on standards um this covers the um, electrical safety earthing and the return circuit of railway traction systems. It's a fascinating one, especially the interfaces to LV. So that's for the HV guys. Um, if you wanted to look further afield, the IEEE Standard 80 in a, uh, uh, in America and parts of America, which is a guide for safety in substations. Grounding. Uh, grounding is very similar to earthing. Um, the IEEE Guide for Measuring Earth Resistivity. These are some very good standards. Um, Standard 81 from the IEEE, if you want to further research the subject, if you're writing your own papers about the effects of energy dissipation and, and good earthing or bad earthing. Now, in England, just coming back on the HV side, we have uh, something called atmospheric transients, lightning protection, and we have four BSEN standards, 62305, part one, your general fundamental principles, your part two, your risk management, three, the physical damage to structures and life hazards, and then four, the electrical and electronic systems within the structures. Now, in England, we do a risk assessment. We use the guidance. Um, as you can see on the screen, we use flash density maps where the weather services record all the lightning strikes so that we can ascertain the level of risk so that we can design a proportionate lightning protection system. So lightning protection systems are, are risk-based. So if you have a risk assessment, then you will design from the risk assessment. If you don't have a risk assessment, then in England, you'll be told to go away and look at 62305. It does need an update, in my opinion, um, and it probably needs an additional one as well for testing. So it could be a part five. Just again, my opinion, it'd be great to see a standard on testing of lightning protection so that we can harmonize that a little bit better. Um, again, further afield, um, lightning protection. Um, NFPA uh, published 780 again this year, the standard for installation of lightning protection. And there's also some secondary research documents from API 545 from the Energy Institute on verification of lightning protection in specialist areas. So there's lots and lots and lots of standards. And that was just a summary of some of the standards. I could have gone into 10 times the length and detail, but it's good to know the first part of a journey of making an engineering decision is understanding what you know, understanding what you don't know. And when you don't know, where do I go and get that knowledge? And the best place is standard. So I always say to people, if you can read and you know where the standards are and you can access them, you're on a very good journey of uh, developing your engineering knowledge. Um, but let's take it back a bit. So let me introduce you to some of the first principles, the, the, the terminology. So in the... Um, wiring regulations i see a somebody has got their hand up um but if it's okay i will uh answer questions at the end apologies i should have said that at the start unless gopa wants to um chip in yeah, yeah. Uh, we will take care later okay great so in bs7671 um we'll put your questions in the chat as well i should have said that so apologies um 7671 has earth defined as the conductive mass of earth whose electric potential at any point is conventionally taken as zero. Now, potential is a word that we love to use in standards. What, what does potential mean? Voltage. So the voltage is conventionally taken at zero. So, oh, hang on. That's, this works. A thing um, is the connection of exposed conductive parts of an installation to the main earthing terminal of that installation. 
Okay, and that's a picture of an earth bar that I installed actually on a, a job where we bonded the steelwork and we had an earthing conductor and CPC. It was a heavy industrial job, as you could tell. Probably should have put that box in an enclosure to protect it from external influences. So we don't always get it right. Um, just to show you some simple pictures, this is how I learn. I'm a visual learner. Um, there's an, a, a chap there standing in a building, the earth electrical appliance, appliance generally of a kettle. If you're going to have a kettle that's metal and it becomes live or energized, what you'll have is somehow a breakdown into proprietary insulation within the device or of the cable. And that then allows a line conductor to come into contact with exposed conductive metalwork. And in theory, uh, when that does, the energy will dissipate down the circuit protective conductor in a manner sufficient to allow the protective device to trip down to the general mass of earth and off safely. So low impedance is very important for safety. Now, what happens if you don't earth the appliance? So maybe the same kettle, but there's no earth connection. Um, and I know in India, you guys have different practices. So uh, let me just get onto this and we'll maybe talk about it. So electrical appliances that have not been earthed, as you can see, you provide that fault path. So you will effectively receive either an electric shock, which will call you, cause you harm, or uh, you will be electrocuted and dead. So there's there's no in-between really there, to be honest with you. It's either you, you get very lucky or you get dead. So earthing is incredibly important because it will take that path, least path of resistance through you down to the ground. And you then have to hope you've selected your devices accordingly, which we'll come on to. Now, I adopt simple rules to learn this stuff, and I like the rule of three. So what is an exposed conductive part? Well, in the wiring regulation, there is a paragraph. But if you break stuff down, so if you're on a, if you're an apprentice or a learner and you're learning this, get a highlighter pen. Highlight things, break the sentences and the paragraphs up so that you can break it down into simple stuff. So exposed conductive part is a conductive part of equipment which can be touched. OK, but it's not normally live. Fine, but it can become live under fault conditions. Three parts to that. Very simple rule to remember exposed conductive part. Yeah. So it's a part of equipment which can be touched. It's not live and it can become live under fault conditions. But then if we look at extraneous conductive parts and i spent when i was younger a lot of time trying to work out what the difference between the two is again use the rule of three break it up highlight it extraneous conductive part is a conductive part liable to introduce a potential a voltage it's generally at earth potential so in theory a pipe that comes out of the ground should be at zero volts um, and not forming part of the electrical installation so if you have an oil pipe a gas pipe a, a water pipe that comes in from the ground we assume that it is at zero volts, um, so it's extraneous. But what do we do then to ensure safety, that it doesn't become part of a path? So what we do is we do equipotential bonding. And equipotential bonding, or equal voltage, is the electrical connection maintaining various exposed conductive parts and extraneous conductive parts at substantially the same potential. So we keep using the word potential, and it's my personal opinion it should be deleted, and just use the term voltage. So if you look here, you have an installation, uh, an electrical appliance that's become live due to a fault, and that person there could be uh, touching a water pipe, which is brought in from the outside. Now, the kettle is an exposed conductive part. Uh, it's exposed metalwork, forms part of the installation, generally expected not to be live, but could become live, and the extraneous conductive part is is very similar but it's it's generally considered zero and it could become life it also could help form a path as you can see the path of fault could go through the gentleman um, who is undergoing that fault condition now simply put equipotential equal voltage so if i if i bond that water pipe as it enters my building in theory i should have a equal voltage so any fault currents that or voltages that uh, connect to any earthed equipment should rise and fall at the same time um, and what i'm going to do is i'm going to just narrate a little video here so a massive thank you to the chaps at gray matters academy wonderful online training provider they are industry leading in hv earthing design earthing services they're brilliant and they've allowed they've they've gone to a lot of time and consideration to create this video so i'm just going to press play and narrate it so what we do is we have energy coming off the grid, high voltages, it's transformed down, goes into overhead poles, 
as a substation, typical substation. It could be anywhere in the world. And what we have here is a, a HV wire that dewires, and we have an earth potential rise. And as that uh, grounds itself or earths itself, it dissipates energy. Not only do the houses lose their power supply, which nobody wants, but of, often happens in a lot of HV installations where there are faults, but the earth potential continues to dissipate through the ground. And this is where earthing and bonding is really important because the critical systems like data centers, that energy is dissipating through the ground and could appear on earthing systems, could cause damage. It could cause damage to uh, cables that are nearby. Uh, it could cause step or touch potentials, as you can see, you know, as that gradient dissipates and the voltage lowers the further it goes, it can energize and appear on uh, exposed or extraneous network and circuits. And electricity has a tendency to go where it wants and do what it wants. Um, we we have a, a, a requirement to control and manage and configure that electrical installation as best as we can. So how do we do it? Well, we basically bond everything together with a bit of green and yellow cable. So that is a, a cross section of an installation where you have the incoming supply cable, the main switch. You have a, a copper earth bar and we bond gas, water, other services, ductwork. And sometimes, depending on the earthing, we put electrodes in. Uh, there is a requirement or a recommendation now for new installations to have electrodes. That wasn't necessarily the case in the UK. So that's kind of just some some fundamentals there on the terminology. Um, I'm going to show you some good and bad examples. Um, that's a terrible one. Uh, obviously, a wind up. I'm sure lots of people have seen this on social media. Um, that's not earthing. That's um, that's called taking the mickey in in, in England. But um, it's it's quite humorous to see that um, we we can have some warped sense of humours. Um, that is a main earth terminal, as you can see, a label that says safety electrical connection do not remove. That's uh, an industrial uh, cooling the tube one actually on London Underground, and everything is labelled, heat shrunk, connected to its own terminal, and you have a drop link connection so that you can disconnect and separate the earthing so that you can test safely. So that's a good practice one. This not so good. Um, Yep, you know, 10 points for the electrode, maybe not into the bucket of dirt. Uh, not great practice there. This is a uh, a picture of a supply, um, which is actually in India, and it shows the, uh, the earthing coming off the sheaf, very similar to England. And in England, we have old networks. You think our networks are near 100 years, years old. So we have metal cutouts, pitch resin filled, which can leak when they get hot because of loading. And that's just an image of a, an earthing system that connects to the sheath of the cable. It's an old lead uh, bitumen impregnated uh, sheath cable. Um, these are more modern in England. We have a supply cable comes in into a service fuse. And a lot of places the earthing will connect either to the sheath of the cable or actually connect to the neutral um, and their TNS, TNCS systems. Um, one of the other things that you get on earthing is you can get some hazards. So that's a 25 mil conductor that had 198 amps flowing through it. So when it goes wrong, it can go wrong terribly, which is why configuration of your earthing is key. It's very important. Uh, if uh, you have access to um, clamp meters, earth leakage meters, I always recommend, and so do the IET, that we look at uh, before we work on earthing systems, we put a clamp to see if there's any energy or any charge. There's 134 amps on that one. Not great. And sometimes the effects of having current flowing through the earthing can be quite disastrous. On the right, there's a gas meter that's melted through um, a fire caused by the sheer level of energy that was pumped through it. And also insulated pipe work where the uh, insulation got so hot it melted and fell off. So, And that's on pipes you don't expect to be carrying electricity. So in England, we don't get it right. And there is a reason behind that. Is a picture that I took. There's 20 amps on an earthing conductor. So that's the fixed electrical installation to the power supply. Don't really want 20 amps on an earthing system, considering that in England, I was taught that it's a benign conductor with zero volts. Um, generally, there are millivolts behind this, but we'll get into that phenomenon in a second. One of the scarier images of my collection is where you have the service cut out, which is the gray um, thing at the top. You have the fuses. Uh, on the floor, but you still have energy. So I've isolated the installation, or as we call in England, the disconnection and separation of all sources of electrical energy in such a manner that it's secure and um, there's still power flowing. So there's a problem on the earthing. So uh, what can we do? How do we understand that better? 
Um, some good practices here uh, in England when we're building stuff, we use um, earth tapes, uh, welded connections, and we create pits to create a large earth mat. They can also use rods as well. That gets covered up. We can also connect to um, rebar. So piling, um, that's a crossrail transformer there. And what we did was we basically put 28 meter piles in the ground, 150 of them, and connected the earthing conductor to the pile cap. And we got a fantastically robust, low impedance earth. So you can use structures and you can use metalwork in the ground. You just make sure that you protect it from corrosion and you inspect it accordingly. Uh, one of the other my favorite things that I've recently been doing over the last few years is getting rid of rods because they can be inherently dangerous. Banging, banging a rod into the ground and hitting a buried surface, especially in England where the, the roads and the streets are quite congested. So I've been trialing some uh, discs, which are carbon uh, coated disc with a copper connection from a company called Earthing Services. They're used in America at the bottom of um, telecoms uh, poles to give a local earth reference so similar to a rod but a lot safer it just bolts onto the bottom of the pole now this is where i take the mickey out myself because occasionally i do like to do some work and there's me uh, digging a hole uh, not very deep because you don't need to put them very deep um, putting in some conductive concrete i know in india i believe we um, use different recipes for earthing of systems i've seen sugar and salt and all sorts of things but um, we use a conductive concrete um, you don't have to by the way you can just drop that in um, as i did there in the image and what we were doing is we were replacing a very good friend of mine's um, earth electrode which had rotted and corroded so we put two discs in dug a small trench bare cable and we got uh, some fresh soil covered it up we got 6.8 ohms which is very good considering you know you recommended 21 200 ohms so that's that's pretty stable pretty good um and we did that was a job i did recently in the last year or so um so getting back to those images where we had that earth current what could be wrong what hidden mystery have we found now um the hidden mysteries we've got is the network risks or what we call in england the dno distribution network operator or the distribution system operator I uh, believe in India they're called the DISCOMs or supplier. Uh, again, feel feel free at the end to kick me if I am incorrect. And one of the things that got raised to me um, was this uh, health and safety report. So in England, we have health and safety alerts if there is an incident. And this is an incident from a gas, a natural gas supply to a house where a coat, as you can see, fell upon the gas meter, which had something called neutral current diversion. And that neutral current diversion was of sufficient measure uh, level that it actually burnt the jacket. Now, this is a pipe that is benign, um, that shouldn't really have this, but it did. So what's going on there? Well, in England, we've got lots of different electricity networks. Um, many, many years ago, when they first started, we had dynamos or generators in the houses. And it was generally for the rich uh, of society to have electricity in the home. And then around the 30s, the national grid came in and we created networks, regional electricity companies. They're now called DNOs. And that's how England is divided with all the different private companies. I, I live in the area for UK power networks, um, just down by the right hand side of London. Now, these networks over time will, like any electrical equipment, they will age. They will suffer impact. They will suffer corrosion. Um, like anything, if they're not looked after or maintained, or they will naturally just reach the end of their life cycle. Now, if you think about that, in the 1970s, the cabling in the streets was 50 years old, so they introduced new cabling, new earthing systems, and we now have a hybrid of the new and old. Um, but before we get into that, uh, there's an IET article, uh, just Google Broken Pen, very, very good article from Michael Peace who discusses the subject very succinctly. Um, and that is the hazard. That is the hidden mystery that we're now on a journey. So everybody in the UK is on a journey looking at broken pens, protective earth neutral conductors, the hazards related to it. And what we'll do is we'll go into that now. So I like to do pictures. So this is a very basic uh, picture of a substation with an earth reference. And in England, um, what we have is basically a combined neutral and earth in the street now. Um, because of the age of the networks that's what they've done we have a live conductor that goes out a line conductor sorry goes into the house into a cut into a cutout and then you have an earth terminal where the water and gas will be bonded or any extraneous services <coughs> excuse me so that's normal 
that's how we wire things and obviously energy goes in goes out back to the transformer no problem at all that's how it should work and then after 50 years 70 years these cables will get old they'll be jointed the joints may not be good and like with any loose connection loose loose wires start fires now over time your impedances or your resistance of your cable can go high and what will happen is that neutral say from house three the return current when it tries to go tries to go back to the substation it will reach a high resistance so it won't want to go there and this leads to then a network imbalance because what's going out is not coming back so what we do is we then find that when you put a clamp meter on your earth wire that water which is a lead pipe or an old copper pipe in the ground some of the energy will divert into those lead and copper pipes and they may travel all the way through and divert around the high resistance joint and into house number two so number three can be fed via the gas or water main into number two so that's known as diverted neutral current or neutral current diversion and eventually i've always said that when you've got energy that shouldn't be there on your earthing system that's a precursor to a failed neutral in the supply network so it's one of the things that we look out for um, and we call it a broken pen and the reason why is i'll show you in a second now, what that leads to is if we do have a broken pen, you could get potentially 230 volts in house three um, with step or touch potential. So you could go outside, touch your tap and have 230 volts. Uh, further down the line, if you have a broken pen where you've got multiple houses across phases, you could have 400 volts, which could lead to great injury. And also, if you get 400 volts, you could find your televisions and all your electronics blowing up or failing. Um, so that's as, as simple as it gets. On a single house, much easier in the countryside. Combine neutral earth. If you fail on the connection, then your neutral earth return is only one way to go, and that's straight down to ground. Hence, we're recommending local electrodes now as well. So that's known as exported diverted neutral current. Um, just to give you some statistics, uh, is this a problem in the UK? Um, yes, it is. It's not a huge problem. It can be managed, but it's one we're trying to raise awareness of. Last year, according to a freedom information request, we had 474 uh, broken neutrals on supplies, um, which isn't a lot in the scheme of things, but is enough to be wary that as the networks age, the hazards increase. I haven't got 2022's numbers yet. Um, just worth noting on Indian Standard uh, 732, page 38, um, it actually mentions the very neutral current three times. Um, so it's quite interesting where protective earth or pen conductors should be earth where they enter any buildings or premises taking into account. So configuration is key. You, you may want to think, well, what do I bond? Where do I bond? How do I earth it? Do I introduce a greater level of diverted currents? Um, especially if you have a failed um, neutral on the supply, more earthing you have, um, the safer you may be but you may actually be masking the failure of the neutral because all the network neutral will come into your property, henceforth the images. Now, just to show you what it's like in England. So this is actually a picture, one of my favorites. It was taken by me and the cable on the right is a lead sheath cable. So this was installed in the thirties. And what you have is effectively three phases, L1, L2, L3, and a neutral. And the lead sheath is a wonderful low impedance earth conductor. The one on the left is the modern cable installed in the 70s, which had a 40 year design life, and that's called a concentric. So what they did was they went with three phases aluminium and they then went with a copper armoring or sheath. And that's the neutral and earth combined. Henceforth, in that photo, they split from the neutral and earth. Now, the problem with that is um, with the combined neutral and earth, if you lose it, then you potentially have to vote neutrals. You potentially have a rise in voltage. So. This is a challenge at the moment in the UK. It's a growing challenge. It's nothing that people need to panic about, but we just need to raise the profile so that people can check and ensure they're safe. Safe working is key. Here's some more images to show you how dangerous this can be. Just some clamp meters around earthing conductors, 43 amps, 58 amps. So it is very much real. Uh, it is also a real thing on railways. Uh, traction return can enter stations and that can cause chaos with the station communications interfere with emc issues so and this this is these are real things that happen nowadays so um, we're still on a journey of evolving learning uh just on that obviously step and touch potential we covered it in the video 
Um, but just some visuals in Ireland, we have a lot of problems with dewirements where they kill our, our beloved cattle. Um, that's an incident in Ireland from an overhead pole that dewired cattle obviously can't take step voltages. So it's something to be mindful of when you're designing an earthing system. Have you considered your touch potentials? Have you considered your step potential, especially on high voltage systems? Uh, and there's some good videos online that will help explain that visually further. On railways, we have some nice, simple visuals on touch and step potential. Uh, we use PPE, we have insulated boots, we have rubber matting in switch room, all sorts of stuff to protect us. This is my favourite picture. It was taken at a domestic property, and that just kind of shows you a broken neutral on the supply, 158 volts, and the clip is attached to the outside water tap, which people plug their hose in. And then the electrician just put an earth, um, an earth, sorry, put a drill into the ground and measured 158 volts. So that just proves the concept of, you know, voltages, they grade across the ground. They can be a hazard because I could touch that drill bit and also the tap and get an electric shock. So just be careful when you are configuring your earthing and bonding. Now, one of the key things uh, for earthing and bonding to its success is um, ZS, ZE, and ME is the phrase I use. In electrical installations, again, if there's any learners on there, I break it into three concise parts, resistance, impedance, ZS, and ZE. Uh, resistance, we look at the resistance when we're looking at earthing of the soil, of the cables, of the exposed parts, of the extraneous parts to prove safety. Once we have those resistances checked and we energize our systems, we then look at impedance. Impedance being the sum total of resistances at a point. It's a fixed point. So you go to a socket, a light, a fuse box, and it, and it does a test. It checks resistance of all paths of resistance. And we want nice low impedances because if we have low impedance, we then have lots of energy flowing to activate our protective devices. Um, and we ensure that the protective devices work. Now, the difference between ZE and ZS, very simple. ZS is a resistance reading taken at a point, and the ZE is the external, so our connection to the general mass of Earth. If we do not have a good ZE, which is noted on your certificates in SP30, um, you don't have a guarantee of safety. Um, so that's worth noting. Now, the reason I raise this is because we have external imp in impedances of all electrical installations when we connect the, the installation to the general mass of Earth. And in the UK, we are getting reports of higher ZE readings. Now, the Energy Networks Association, who are the voice of the electricity networks, they issue guidance. So uh, I don't know if Indian uh, suppliers issue guidance in a similar manner. I'm sure we could talk about that in a minute. And uh, are higher ZE readings the future? Well, naturally with age, if we're not maintaining stuff, then yes. So well, how do we kind of mitigate that? Well, you saw in the photos I was putting in uh, discs or rods. There's some really good guidance out there as well, where it kind of gives you, in England, we have a 100 amp service head, and it gives you the earth fault loop impedance, and it tells you that you know 90% will have below 0.34, but they also acknowledge there will be installations, millions of services where they may be higher than that. So, and it's good that they're publishing this sort of stuff because obviously we need these eddies to make sure we've got sufficient fault current to flow. One of the more scary points in the UK is note two, distribution network operators are under no obligation to design or maintain networks to provide a particular maximum value of earth loop impedance. However, under our electrical safety quality continuity regulations, they are obliged to maintain the earthing. So a little bit of contradiction there and it makes it very gray. Um, always an interesting debate with your uh, network supplier for sure. Um, but some companies will publish very simple guides to earth loop impedance, maximum values, 0.35s, depending on the, the level of energy, uh, 0.8, the standard values for the different earthing systems. We have what we call PME, protected multiple earth, also known as TNCS, and a separate neutral and earth, also known as TNS. And the networks originally were TNS. Uh, they're now pretty much all combined neutral and earth, unless they're on a private transformer. Uh, personally, I think separate neutral and earth was always the way to go. But um, just to let you know, uh, some DNO companies will allow a hybrid. So the photo you'll see in a minute is a hybrid of multiple earthing systems. It can be confusing for an electrician when they're trying to ascertain what it is. 
I've always said go for the worst case. So in exceptional circumstances, hybrid earthing, and that's from Northern Ireland. In England, it's the norm. Um, there are lots and lots of guidance in England for voltage fluctuations, application of PME, connection of generators, all sorts of stuff. Now, this is three of the more common systems we have. We have TT, Terra Terra, which is earth electrodes, if you only have a supply live and neutral. We have TNS, Terra Neutral, separate, so it comes in completely separate. And then TNCS, Terra Neutral Combined Separate, which is that cable there. Uh, it comes in from the bottom and basically connects into the fuse. But as you can see, that's a hybrid arrangement. In fact, if you look at the white cable from in the earth terminal, that could go to uh, an earth rod. So is it TT, TNS or TNCS? More than likely, it's uh, a, a TNCS that somebody has tried to lower the impedance by connecting to the sheath and possibly put an electrode on rather than fixing a network fault, because obviously, as you can imagine, networks, cables in the ground cost a lot of money to fix and repair. So just on to one of the last bits, RCD performance. Uh, RCDs are a wonderful bit of tech. Um, they've been out for many, many, many years, since 1939. Some of the examples where we had voltage uh, fault leakage breakers, VOE LCBs, um, RCDs to BS4293, 61, BSEN 6108 and BSEN 61009. So we've gone on a huge journey of making the earth leakage protective device um, accessible to the market. And it, all it's ever done is improve safety. You know, it protects against fire and it protects against, uh, you know, indirect shock. So it's a good thing if it works. And Chris's excellent webinar uh, kind of raised a few points on the correct selection and erection and configuration of RCDs, because some of these do rely on an, a, a functional earth connection. Now, I wanted to give you a few little gems, little nuggets, really, to kind of bookend Chris's excellent webinar. Um, the pictures kind of says it all. Uh, BSEN 5178 in 1998 it clearly showed that if you had something where DC pulsating current could occur you would configure the installation in your board separately so you've got type A RCDs protecting circuits a time delayed RCD to ensure you have selectivity but then separate to that a type B which give you more immunity to DC and if there was leakage you wouldn't saturate or blind the type A so this is why I, I keep saying to people, configuration is key. Configuration of your protective devices, configuration of your earthing is incredibly important. If we fast forward to 2021, it's actually 2022 that came out, um, and it's, it's mainly a product standard. Electricians generally don't know about it, but I find this chart quite fascinating. So BSEN 62477 Part 1. And it talks about um, power electronic conversion systems and compatibility with the rcd well, that's interesting so it's plug connected and it's um greater than uh 16 amp or three phase then we ask does it connect cause a dc current and if it does we take cautions and then potentially we apply a type b rcd or and if that won't work we then apply another protective measure but if we have um plug connected and it's um less than 16 amp then we're recommending a type a compatibility but yet in our wiring regulations, we still have type AC, although it's strongly recommended that they're not used and they have been banned around various parts of Europe. So it's really important that you, you, you look at what will my fixed installation do? Is it a communications rack? You know, will it produce DC leakage from the, from the uh, switch mode power supplies? Of course it will. Um, and if it does, is type A enough? Have we done enough? Um, one of the interesting pieces in this was, um, if you when you apply another protective measure one of the recommendations was double insulation so double insulation um, plus your type b so that way if your rc did didn't work you still have that the, the additional measure of double insulation so there's some fascinating knowledge in the standards that help you consider your rcd protection more we don't generally put one rcd covering everything um we used to years ago as main switches um, but we kind of realized that there was a folly in doing that using voltage reference points so now we um, we've gone on a journey where we subdivided the installation and we're now at a point where i'll show you an image uh, where we have rcds in each way which gives the optimal subdivision of the installation ensures earth leakage can't cause nuisance tripping and if there is a fault we minimize the impact to the user which is what a good electrical engineer should be designing for now for those who are on that learning journey um i certainly was um and still am 
fuses fundamental principle of protection there current flows under fault the element gets hot and it blows that's your fuse your mcb has two components that's bsen 60898 or formerly bs3871 and that has a bimetallic strip which can get hot or a little electromagnetic coil which will look for an imbalance and there are millions of mcbs around the uk we've obviously been on a journey bs4293 standard rcds which we would use used to put two of them in a board and split the installation in half and that would look for earth leakage up to 30 milliamps uh, thankfully we have technology and the wonders of technology allowed compact rcbos uh, which you then have a little neutral reference lead for and that's kind of standard what we do now in most installations probably in the last five to ten years in the uk and that's a type a as well now Interestingly enough, some of them have additional leads as well, functional earths, because some of them may rely on a connection to earth so that they can uh, operate and function correctly, get an earth reference. But when we're on that journey of uh, selection and erection or selection of our protective devices, we're now in a world in England where we have an arc fault detection device to BSEN 62606. We have uh, surge protection to protect against atmospheric uh, strikes and strokes so strikes being a direct strike stroke being the after effect where you could get transients of thousands of volts and we then do uh, staged protection to ensure that any voltage uh, spike within the installation it dissipates and is protected and connected to earth so there's device that's essential to earth we now have um, the opdd which is soon to have a standard and that's the uh, open pen detection device. And there's one that's been manufactured by a British company called Mate. And that looks for a supply neutral loss. So it, it's a device that effectively can protect against rise, hazardous rises in voltages. So that's that's something that's fairly new in the UK. And they, they have a whole suite of devices that can protect. And if you look around the world, you've also got something called a POP device. Now, a POP device, similar to a surge, but rather than looking for thousands of volts, it will look for voltages outside the normal bands. Say you go and you get 290 volts single phase to earth. It will look at that for a few seconds and then disconnect to protect your installation from any stresses or strains because of the network. So there's lots and lots of devices now we have to pick and we have to configure them correctly as well as our earthing. Now, there's two types of RCDs I just wanted to skip through. Voltage independent must comply with the International Standard 61008, parts 1, 2, and 1. And these RCDs rely on the energy of residual current to activate the RCD. So the leakage current, that residual current, that's what activates it. They are often referred to as the old clunky electrical mechanical RCDs, and they are voltage independent in operation. Okay, so um, we then have voltage dependent. And they requ they require compliance with 61009, 1, 2, and 1. And these RCDs use the mains voltage to power an electronic circuit and the tripping mechanism to activate the RCD. So they're referred to as electronic RCDs and a voltage dependent. Now, the majority of RCDs out there are electronic ones. They're voltage dependent. The older ones, uh, it's always been said, will work if you have a loss of neutral because it, it's obviously if you lose the mains, and you still have some energy there and there's a fault you can still operate that device potentially um what are the advantages of voltage independent well loss of neutral the loss of this is directly from a white paper the loss of neutral may happen for seven reasons um and anywhere unless we're in a tnc which we don't recommend both in multi-phase and phase to neutral supply lines the cases of unwanted interruptions to the neutral conductor can be defective breakers that do not close a neutral loose connections works on electrical lines or nearby electrical conductors in the case of a lot of neutral, hazardous voltage is still present, but the voltage dependent RCDs cannot trip in case of this fault. With risk for human life, it is commonly said that probability of loss of the neutral is negligible, but as you can see, it is growing. So we need to just be mindful of it. Power against over voltage protection devices could be an answer. Open devices could be an answer. In the UK, people are exploring that and very successfully exploring it. So it's still an exciting journey we're on as to how we select and erect best. But one bit of advice, please check in your standards for the special national conditions in the appendix. So this is BSC and 61009. That's a combined MCB uh, RCD with overcurrent protection. And it has some little overcurrent uh, special conditions that say in Ireland, 61009s dependent on line voltage can can be used you can use unswitched neutrals uh, in the uk 
where neutrals are reliable at Earth potential RCBOs with, un uh, with unswitched neutral are permitted. But what if you don't have that? What if you have an installation where you have single pole devices and you have diverted neutrals and a, a rise in neutral current? then surely you don't have a reliable earth potential there, potentially. Um, so, yeah, so it's worthwhile looking uh, through your standards to see if there is any national conditions. Now, this is my favourite picture of all time. It's my fuse board downstairs. And that is what I call a minimal viable product. It is a uh, fuse box, a very witty pun from the manufacturer. It's actually a consumer unit. And what I have there is my installation. It's 21-way board. And I've labeled it all up. And each one of those devices, except for the surge, is an RCBO. So if there is a fault on the boiler controls, it only trips that. Sockets externally. So I have the added protection of an MCB and an RCD for every way. And I have surge protection. So that's a standard board. That's probably about 100 and hundred pound for the board, plus the devices themselves. If you're looking at maybe three to 500 pound for a for a fuse board in england but that gives you a very robust benchmark for safety so that's my one downstairs um kind of final thought really <clears throat> while i've been on this journey and thank you very much for coming on it with me uh indian standard 732 and sp30 it is not permitted to use voltage independent rcds in domestic and similar installations however in my opinion and i'm sure um, chris will agree the prohibition in the indian regulations may not be the right approach maybe there's a little bit more work needs to be done there um, we also need to think what devices in relation to your thing do we need and how many do we need to select? We need to check our standards. Configuration is key. We need to keep up to date. We need to go on that journey. It doesn't matter where we are. As long as we're on the journey, the journey generally never ends. And most importantly to everybody out there, stay safe. Thank you very much. It's been a roller coaster and uh, we'll go to the questions. Please watch this back on YouTube if there's any more bits you want to message me on social media and say you're wrong or i've had another thought but thank you over to you gopa thank you thank you very much mr paul this was a fantastic uh, uh, journey and uh, as you said the roller coaster but uh, uh, anyway we will be uploading the video in our youtube channel so people those who wanted to uh, uh, look into it they can uh, look into the video and they can also post the their comments in the uh, uh, YouTube so that we can reply to them in a, on a later stage. We have few questions, uh, approximately 15 questions are there. I would like to take up these questions. Also, I agree to you, Mr. Paul, uh, you told that uh, the voltage dependent uh, RCDs are not allowed in India. I don't know from where this started, but um, probably in future we will also, uh, we, we should, we will start asking the question why, why this is not well, allowed. I think I know where from because the electromechanical devices are very clunky and old and expensive, whereas electronics are cheaper. So a lot of the manufacturers are not making them anymore. And that's where it's come from. <laughs> from my research, that is. Please feel free of your manufacturer to tell us yeah. <clears throat> in the comments. <clears throat> Excuse me. See that uh, in one of the old versions of uh, 7430, uh, somewhere it was written that voltage operated, not the new one, the old one, voltage operated uh, RCDs are some, some comments were there. I think probably it also started from that particular point. So you also showed the IS, the, the BIS, uh, sorry, the, the SP, uh, the CP1013. I have my copy here, the CP. I bought uh -huh. it. Uh, you know, 20 years uh, back, the old uh, uh, British uh, standard code of practice, CP1013, 1965. Mm. The Indian standard uh, code of practice of everything, the first edition was published in 1965. 66, in fact. Also, we had the IS732, which was published in 1958. So, we also have actually, maybe, you know, a, a long history. So, first of all, let, let us go through the some of the questions. The first question is from Mr. Sanjay Mulai, where uh, whether supplementary equipotential bonding will help to clear fault is the mm. first So, there's a yes and no in that. Um, it will help to equalize potentials. So, it will give you equipotentials between two conductive or extraneous parts. Not necessarily help clear the fault unless that link creates a lower impedance. Um, we, we used to in, in bathrooms, which is a high risk in houses, cross bond, supplementary bond, everything, the lights, the radiators, the taps and everything to try and ensure, uh, where there was a high risk in bathrooms that we would, um, 
ensure that there was equal voltages but i mean it depends on the installation if you've got a large industrial installation and you're putting supplementary bonding in everywhere then possibly but in england we don't kind of do that much supplementary bonding anymore it's it's kind of only where it's required via either test or it's a special location that requires it um we used to bond everything everything got bonded in the 15th edition we bonded metal window frames doors anything that was metal got bonded it was it was insane you had pigtails and coils and we went a bit mental uh to be honest with you doing that but um I would argue that not really, unless the connection of supplementary bonding leads to a lower impedance, then that would form part of the protective measure. But that's not really what supplementary bonding is about. Um, Krish, I've done loads of talking. You can you can give your opinion now. I need a drink. No, I agree. Uh, uh, the, yeah, sorry. No, no, yes, Krish. No, so I think that uh, it's just to create and the equip. It's just to reinforce the equipotential zone and make sure we're staying within that fifty volt touch limit. If and like uh, like Paul said, it's only if it creates an even more low impedance path. But uh, generally, that uh, I don't see that happening. So yeah, the point is the equipotential bonding creates the equal and uh, the equipotential zone, and the it has to go back to the source, which is the transformer, and that's what the protective earthing is for. So yeah, yeah. Actually, the supplementary equipotential bonding is the main. Its main purpose is to reduce the touch voltage. So it's not for uh, uh, you know taking the fault current. That is what is defined so far in these standards. So, Mr. Paul, we have another question again from Mr. Sanjay. Generally, in a healthy earthing system, how much leak maximum allowed in the earth conductor? So, say that again. Uh, what is the maximum allowed uh, earth current, the continuous current uh, through the earthing conductors or through the protective conductors? Ah, right, leakage. <clears throat> okay yeah so oh hang on my computer is going weird on me apologies what is happening on my computer actually in india this is a big uh, issue because most of the time uh, we have the habit of using non-standard products as a result uh, uh, the leakage currents are much more also you know sometime uh, i was i was coming across this situation especially variable frequency drives and places where uh, semiconductors are used the leakage currents are much more sometime in uh, 200, 300 milliamps and sometimes even in amperes. And we also have a funny device sold in the market called as a digital grounding device. These guys, it's a black box and these guys uh, make a short circuit between neutral and earth uh, inside the installation or closer to a machine. Over to you, Mr. Paul. Okay. Um, so generally what we have is a rule of thumb in the UK. So we have a, a, a percentage of the circuit. So with a 30 milliamp RCD, general rule of thumb is, is no more than 10 milliamps, really. Um, there is actually IEC papers on the correct usage. So BSE, oh no, IEC technical report 62305 gives guidance on, on how to work out leakages. So part of that selection and erection of a circuit there is actually a formula where if you can go on say schneider google schneider they'll give you a breakdown of all of the uh, product leakage devices um, sorry product leakages so kettles cookers showers and what you can do is let's say you have a, a pc or a laptop you may have two milliamps so when you're designing that circuit you want to design a circuit so the leakage doesn't go above your 30 milliamp threshold and obviously you want that tolerance of you know switching on surges etc so you generally design it for say about 10 milliamps and what you then do is you go, well, OK, well, how many products can I actually uh, connect to it? So if you take the two milliamp rule, uh, you can then go, OK, two, four, six, eight, ten. So you've got five devices. If you apply a 0.75 factor to it, you find that you can probably put six or seven devices uh, in a healthy RCD protected circuit. But again, as a designer of the installation um, at the moment in the UK, there is only a requirement to be mindful of the earth leakage not overwhelming and tripping the device henceforth subdivision of the installation there's no real fixed rule other than a percentage of the circuit which is about 10 percent, if i remember rightly chris you probably have got it in your brain off the top of your head but it's early for me <laughs> uh, even in the is 732 it is there uh, even uh, for a fixed uh, equipment more than 20 amps so the maximum leakage current is 10 milliampere but uh, okay. if 
devices which is using uh, semiconductor or Y capacitors as filter, then uh, the leakage current will be more. But there are measures to handle it. These are also explained uh, very well in IA732. And we, we need to be mindful as well that all electronics now in their natural performance will leak to Earth. Yes. So you will get natural leakage. So if you put a clamp meter on an earthing system, you will get natural leakage, and that can, and that can be perfectly healthy. It's when you try and disconnect an earth wire and it blows up in your face, that's when you need to be mindful that there could be a problem. Okay. Uh, henceforth, configuration is very important. Yes, yeah, very, very important. So the next question from Mr. Vivek Tiwari, uh, what is instrumentation sensitive earthing? In Indian context, the European OEMs connect all earthing. Okay, basically, I will tell you, I will explain you not going through the question. Uh, for example, most of the machines, let's say, for example, the biomedical equipment, the European system, the European machine manufacturer in their catalogs, they very clearly explain how to make equipotential bonding. But the same supplier, once when it comes to India, they ask for a separate connection to a separate earth electrode and they call this as clean earthing. This is a big uh, problem which we are facing uh, in uh, all over India. What's your opinion about uh, this? Oh, dear. The good old-fashioned clean earth, eh? Oh, blimey. Um, yes, the clean earth. Um, we. Uh, I remember hearing about clean earthing 25 years ago, and I was like, okay, how is it clean? Do we wash it? What do we actually do? How how do you clean this earth? Now, if you think about that video I showed where you've got that energy dissipating. Now, imagine in that uh, IT center, I have a rod and I call it my clean earth. How is it clean? <laughs> energy dissipates through the ground. It gets picked up on all conductive systems. Um, unless you put some sort of diode system or some weird over-the-top engineered system, you're not really going to have a clean earth. I do know of one place where they did put a one-way diode on an earth to stop it coming into the installation and they call that clean earth but um i don't believe there is such a thing as a clean earth uh, happy to be told otherwise by my peers of course yeah actually what happened is uh, some of the equipment manufacturers they are the the indian manuals they modify it uh, and they remove the equipotential bonding part and they put this separate earth electrode because Everywhere, people have the impression that the symbol 5019, that, you know, the, the earthing symbol, they think that it is a separate, uh, you know, connection oh, to an road in soil. No, so. no, that, that can be for a CPC, a circuit protecting conductor. I don't think I would put an earth electrode for every single piece of equipment. I couldn't guarantee the safety of the performance of the equipment. Um, one thing I will say, if you don't mind me, is manufacturers, bless them, um, they will tell you anything they can to sell you stuff. And that's that's not a besmirch on all manufacturers, but I have I have heard some whopping lies from manufacturers to get me to buy stuff. Um, good engineers trust but verify. Um, and we do need to understand, yes, that little symbol for Earth doesn't mean electrode. It just means connection to the earthing system, a correctly configured system. And what you want is one point. Let's pull out this. If you had a building where you had a supply Earth and then a local Earth at a piece of equipment, and you had energy dissipating underneath through the ground, you could pick up energy into your equipment and then back through the electrical system. So you're actually allowing energy to flow through. So you're effectively allowing diverted fault energy, which is referenced in IS732 and SP30. It talks about diverted fault energy. So you don't, this is why configuration, I am a big fan of one point of connection to the general mass of Earth. If you have more, make sure it's configured and controlled correctly. Yeah, actually, this, this, all these uh, the uh, the uh, wrong ideas came into the picture, or uh, you know, because of some of the misinterpretations of the earlier regulation. But in the current regulation, which was published uh, during June 2023, it has very clearly written that uh, earthing, the definition of earthing, has been changed, and earthing means uh, equipotential bonding, and every building shall have uh, equipotential bonding. All these are now very clearly made, and probably we can find see the changes very soon. So thank you very much for that answer. Now we have a question from Mr. Ulas Bajray. Uh, when we talk about uh, equipotential bonding, even connecting gas and water pipe as shown in the figure shown by Mr. Paul Minan, however, IS1646 clause 8.2 state that no, in no case shall gas, steam, sprinkler or humidifier pipes uh, be used for an earth connection. So is it not a violation of this clause? That's a really good 
point so i i am going to default um to your expertise there but in england we have commonly always bonded gas and water and interestingly enough the reason we have always get bonded gas and water is many many years ago when the supply networks first started um it was imperative that the gas and water pipe was used as part of the earthing system however obviously that energy flowing and increased energy flowing has corroded and been detrimental to the networks so in England, a lot of the networks are now converting to um, plastic polypipes, which then uh, unmasks hidden problems. So houses where they may have a failed earth could have been masked via a lead water main or a, a gas main. So I'm actually kind of pleased to see in, in your regulations it says no gas, steam or sprinkler, because let's be perfectly frank, if you've got current flowing through your gas pipe um, and there's a leak one day and you get a spark, you've got an explosion. So hey it's it's an interesting one maybe it's we um we have to ensure that all our supplies have got insulated inserts non-conductive and then maybe we do some supplementary bonding to protect further but that's a really good point good uh yeah let's update our regs that sounds uh, like a, an advancement maybe there are there may be chances for mistakes also in this standard uh, so uh the, this whole uh standard for example if you look at the ie rule or the cea regulation 2010 Regulation number 41, sub-regulation number 10. What it writes is, no person shall make a connection with the earth by the aid of, nor shall he keep in contact with the, any water mains not belonging to him, except with the consent of the owner thereof and the electrical inspector. So the regulation says, uh, if you, you know, without permission from the owner of the pipe, you are not supposed to bond. The regulation never says that uh, you shouldn't bond. That is not there. But in a way, you get the permission from the uh, from the owner of the metal pipe and you bond it. That is what is written. But what happened is this was misinterpreted. And people start reading only the first line. No person shall make connection with the earth. So only that part, if you read the first line, if you read it, gives an impression that you should not connect. I think the gas one is valid steam sprinkler stuff like that yeah we would probably still buy again if they're extraneous we test for if they're extraneous because you're trying to mitigate the the bringing in of hazardous voltages to ensure that you don't get a shock when you're making a cup of tea and leaning up against a radiator or a, a steel structure so but the gas one i kind of do agree i think gas possibly maybe we need to do something with the pipes to take that out of the the realms of bonding those pipes yeah. it's an interesting one for debate chris I just wanted to add something. So the standard Mr. Vajari is referring to, it, I think it's referring to the fact that you shouldn't use a gas pipe, a steam pipe, a sprinkler pipe, or a humidifier as a means of earthing. So that's as an electrode. That obviously you're not supposed to do without, um, in any case. So that's similar to what 7671 says as well. You're not supposed to use those as an electrode. Yes. yes. No, you shouldn't be. No. Yeah. Although we do yeah. by default. Yeah. Potential bonding anyway. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so uh, in simple conclusion, you you must bond it, but uh, you should not make it uh, think that the whole fault current is, or don't allow the fault current to, to flow through this route. That is what is necessary. So the next question from Mr. Sanjay Mulai, in case of a TNCS system, if the neutral broken, then what is the protection to avoid over voltage in distribution system? Um, so, as I said, at the moment, the, the, the go-to thing in England is these OPDD devices, open pen, protective earth neutral detection devices, seem to be the, the great next hope to mitigate that. The, the, the bigger debate there is, is the lack of product standards at the moment for it the the risk of introducing any new technology its performance obviously um and also there's a, there's a bigger question of why are we mitigating for the supplier's failure you know why why does the homeowner have to pay because the electricity network that you pay your money to in your bill hasn't to maintain the network but again i suppose it's your risk appetite how much are you willing to pay to protect your home your family um do you have correctly configured bonding do you need it do you want it do you know do you want to have a per power over voltage protection device we don't have them in england at the moment they're in europe but the the opdd devices the open pen detection devices they do look uh promising 
I'm still looking into them uh, in greater detail, but I think for me, you can't beat good, good old fashioned earthing and bonding as your fundamental measure for protection. Um, look at that, a pop eaten. Chris has got his stuff. Okay. Oh yeah, that's a big one. <laughs> but uh, in 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 India, we ha we have some kind of over voltage uh, relay. So, which measures the voltage and which uh, try to trip, but unfortunately, it measures the potential between neutral and the live conductors, phase conductors. It's not a perfect solution, but sometimes it is uh, a yeah, solution. Yeah, the, the Mate stuff effectively measures between phases and or phase and neutral and creates like a ghost Earth reference that it can reference against the real Earth. Um, it's quite clever uh, electronics. I, I'm still looking into it, but it does look and appear to be... Um, a viable solution and it seems to be used a lot in electric vehicle charging technology as well yeah yeah yeah. so thank you thanks for the answer the next question is is it recommended to install rcd as a mitigation uh, if uh, fault loop impedance fail the test fails that means yeah. as a measure for uh, a fault protection uh yes it is however there is a um, a folly of our industry so we got it wrong we have this uh, rule that's a very terrible rule of the 1,667 ohms. You can uh, you can allow 1,667 ohms if you have an RCD, but that's great. But that still doesn't offer you any protection against fault currents. It's only earth leakage. So if you have 1,500 ohms, yes, if you have earth leakage, you can rely on your RCD. But if you have an overcurrent, you've got nothing yeah. still. Yeah. But a good earthing, good low impedance, will allow sufficient energy flow, and Krish is going to carry on. I just like to add that about falling back on the RCD. If you look at uh, clause four point two point eleven point four point four in uh, seven three two, it also does mention that where compliance with this subclause is provided by an RCD, so on and so forth. The point is that you're only supposed to actually rely on the rcd for fault protection if it's not achievable if the the loop impedances are not achievable so just because the cables are undersized it's not an excuse to say that okay we'll, we're not achieving fault protection through our ocpd and ads and then we fall back to the rcd you want to achieve fault protection through uh, automatic disconnection of supply which is equipotential bonding equi uh, protective earthing and uh, automatic disconnection of supply you and you want to do that ideally through an OCPD. You only want to fall back to an RCD if and only if it's unachievable. Not that if there's a non-compliance and you just bang in an RCD and then achieve compliance. Yeah, yeah. We we did some bad things by creating that that horrific rule of thumb because it it became a a um, a rumor or a wives' tale in England where yeah one six six seven fine. They test, they do it, they wouldn't think. And that we should always think. We should always be thinking. Yeah, the next question is again from Mr. Sanjay Mulai. Is IEC 60364 and BS7671, both are similar or is there any difference? The earthing part. Um, 7671 basically takes its guidance from 60364. There'll obviously be local conditions that are agreed by the JPEL committee, but fundamentally very much... We're very aligned, to be perfectly frank. Um, any real local UK conditions, we have a, a 200 number against them. Um, but yeah, we're, we're very aligned, basically. We just use our terminology, but no 60364 part 5, part 54 is yeah. is our chapter 54. So we, we are very aligned. Who knows how long we will be aligned for because it's ever emerging and ever changing. Um, but yeah. Also, just on that last one, RCDs, by the way, um, it can be used, for, it has to be used for a TT installation where you only have an electrode. So that's a, for fire safety, uh, obviously. In, in our standard in IS3043, what we have uh, written is if the fault loop impedance is uh, failing, that means if your OCPD is unable to disconnect in case of a fault, then you should put an RCD and uh, uh, the RCD I delta N is uh, 30 milliampere. Probably 30 milliampere may not be required for fault protection, but this is what is written in the in the standard, which has originated few few years back. Anyway, the revision of these standards are still going on. We will seriously look into it. Actually, we have an interesting question. The next question from Mr. Lokesh Ashok. 
how, how to figure out between T and TT, T and CS system. I think the same discussion we can even have uh, after 50 years, probably in India, because this is the most confusing subject. Uh, uh, majority of, uh, because you know, the electrical safety is not a part of our curriculum in the engineering. It's not a part of the subject, uh, engineering subject. As a result, uh, the confusion of this system everything is very much uh, uh, prevailing in the market. The people doesn't know how to, uh, you know, uh, how to make it. So if you don't know how to make it, then how to check it is uh, the next part. If, if you don't know to make it, then, if you, then you cannot check it, uh, basically. The, Discom engineers, the distribution company engineers, uh, maybe 90% doesn't know this uh, subject. I am sorry yes. uh, for the participants, yes. those who are listening to me. It's a fact. You should accept the fact. It's an interesting one because we were taught when I was in college that it's very easy to look at supply intake and understand the earthing configuration. But over the years that I've been on my journey, the networks have failed and they have hybrid the what was a TNS system, very clearly separate neutral uh, earth on the sheath. But when you go into the substation or into the cable behind the house, you'll find that the neutral earth are linked. So what I found over the years is what I think to be a TNS. And I wrote to my network and said, is it reasonable to assume that the TNS supplies in my area are actually TNCS or PME in the street? And they actually wrote back and said, yes, unless it's off a private transformer, private TNS, it's a very reasonable assumption because to keep the network running, the engineers will reconfigure. It. And if you lose a cable, then they'll they'll piggyback on sheathing and all sorts to keep that neutral earth connection going. So what you've got was what I call a Frankenstein network that's old, where everything that's earth is combined neutral and earth, which is not great for network balance. Because you've got so many neutral references, the energy dissipates everywhere before it gets back to the substation. So we've kind of created one mess to solve another mess. But um, yeah, I mean, it's by inquiry. It, it, I think is also in our certification, isn't it? By inquiry, uh, obviously visual inspection. But again, speak to your local supplier is my recommendation as to how it all works. Actually, we we tried uh, speaking to the local supplier, but uh, local discom. We call the the energy supplier as discom distribution company, but unfortunately, okay. uh, you don't get any answer. You, you know, some, funny enough, the DNOs sometimes don't want to talk to us either. Electricians can be very annoying to the electricity supply company trying to do a good job, highlighting how bad their network is. You don't become popular. Yeah. <laughs> See, one of the problems which we face all over India is whenever there is a fault on the HT side of the transformer, mostly the system, uh, low voltage system is TT and uh, whenever there is a fault on the HT side of the transformer, the low voltage side, the equipment, connected equipments are failing. And uh, it's uh, in, in my view, it, uh, the, the, the DISCOM has to be penalized because we are paying for electricity and we are uh, taking their troubles into our house and our equipment are burning. Unfortunately, legal system has to be improved, uh, uh, and I'm sure it will happen soon. Yes, totally agree. I think the same in England, that the electricity companies should be held with their feet to the fire far more clearly by the governments, without a doubt. Yeah. So we have a question from uh, an anonymous attendee. If Ooh. the power supply distribution, actually once when they log in, uh, some people don't want to put their name. So they feel that, uh, you know, making their name uh, public maybe is dangerous. Hello, anonymous. Yeah, anonymous attendee. If the power supply distribution company does not confirm the type of power supply network provided, is there a method available to identify? I think this is the same question which we had earlier. Further, how can one differentiate between TNS and TNCS network on the side because... Uh, uh, I would like to skip this question. Vis Gentlemen. Visual inspection is the answer to that. That will tell you straight away is what is the means of connection between the the uh, earthing and the neutral of the electrical installation. So does the earthing connect to the sheath of the conductor? You could ascertain it separate. Does it go into the fuse cutouts or the, the fuse heads? You can ascertain that it's a combined neutral and earth system. But again, it's, it's kind of a joke. So I did a webinar on my E5 page, where all we did was coding of intakes. And it was taking people on a journey of the older stuff, sharing our knowledge of that's a service intake. It's a TNS, it's a TNCS, what are the hazards? So we did a long webinar on that. If anybody wants to watch it, please go ahead. Um, it's quite enjoyable looking at some of the hazards in England and the different cutouts. 
at the end of the day this is the knowledge that we're not very good as an industry at sharing so henceforth we did the webinar on it but um, i'm sure you guys have got pictures of intakes which would leave me guessing as to whether it's a tns tncs or some weird frankenstein butchered version yeah thank you there is a question from mr uh Chessring Hosfell, uh, it's not an Indian name, sorry to pronounce bad if it is. Uh, is it advisable to connect a earth cable to reinforcement bar of the building as it will eventually lead to corrosion of the steel bar in long run, posting a threat to structural part of the building? Really good question. Um, what is the term? It's on the tip of my tongue. So there is potential, yes, if you connect an earthing system to steel reinforcement that you could actually get, uh, we called it concrete cancer. Oh, it's especially for on DC railways where you have DC traction. So the, the, the basically the DC will absolutely eat the, um, especially on railways. If you, if you bond, say, an overhead line system to a car park, that car park steelwork will just degrade at an accelerated pace, whether it's AC or DC. So for the bigger systems, yes. For a domestic small house, I would suggest no. But then again, um, on larger buildings, you bond the structural steel. So you are creating a path anyway. Um, for Crossrail, we used a, a pile cap wall that was designed for like a 175-year life. And it was just purely HV for the tunnel boring machines and stuff. So short term use. Again, it's, it's, it's kind of understanding when you're given the supply, what is it being used for? What are the hazards that are going to be uh, provided there? Are we, are we connected to a DC traction railway? There's a perfect example because that will corrode everything and anything near it structurally. Is that an acceptable risk? Um, again, these are all things that need to be asked in the design phase. Um, but it's a very, very good question. And I'm annoyed now that I can't remember the phrase. Uh, there is a phrase for this uh, effect. And I have a white paper on it. And there are white papers online that are fascinating that show car parks that have almost collapsed. Um, and I can't remember it, so apologies. Yeah. So so basically, for uh, in case of AC, there is absolutely no issue. But uh, the connection for large buildings, anyway, the DC current flows are there if you are near to a DC traction system. Some of the c cities in India have got uh, DC uh, metro railways. We could oh. do a webinar just on that. That's a webinar in itself, just that, the effects of um, AC and DC on structures. Okay, that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. So again, from uh, Mr. Chosfell, uh, do we have uh, regulations in India to follow which type of earthing system, TT, TNS, TNCS in a distribution network? Uh, Mr. Chosfell, uh, this is a very difficult question. There are regulations, but the problem is uh, only few people read the regulation and the majority of the people doesn't know or to, to, to or the DISCOMS doesn't uh, in fact, uh, doesn't want to follow any of these regulations because they, they have the systems which they were following for decades and they feel that uh, it is the, the the best system they do in paper. Uh, most of the, if we look at in the DISCOM, 99% uh, uh, cases, uh, instead of compliance, we can see non-compliance. So this is the main reason for uh, dying, you know, death of almost 14,000 people every year uh, due to electrocution in India, one of the largest uh, maybe worldwide. A majority, about 50% of these accidents are happening in the distribution. Also, about 50% happens within the consumer premise because uh, most of the time, if there is a fault in the consumer premise, the incoming fuse is not blowing because... Uh, there is no earth fault protection, for example. So there are several reasons. It's a, it's a big, you know, it's a Pandora box. If we open, you know, we, have, we can discuss for several days. So there is a question from Mr. David. Is there a test that can be conducted to determine if a metallic part is of extraneous potential? Mr. Betteridge, hello. Um, I'm going to allow Krish to answer this one. He knows, yes, he knows there is. Um, Go on, Krish. Yes. So... Well, you've got to basically test the resistance and there's an equation. I know it's in guidance note, uh, which one is it? The one for earthing and bonding. And if it's between a certain value, they start on top of my head, then it is extraneous. If it's not, then it's not. That's right, right? 
Yeah. Uh, just oh, open the it. guidance note up. Hold on. Oh. So just on that term I was looking for, cathodic protection is is a whole bag of how we use energy to counteract corrosion and in, in, oh, it's oh we yeah. could talk for hours on this. So, uh, so the question from Mr. Vivek Tiwari, what is the significance of neutral to earth voltage? What is the safe value? Many OEMs, especially Europeans, ask for this value to be less than 1 ohm. Uh, Mr. Vivek Tiwari, it is not the European OEMs, those who are asking this voltage. It is the Indian counterparts of those OEMs asking this question. But however, to Mr. Paul. So this is an interesting one because the network providers now when they are analyzing their network, they actually do a neutral to earth loop impedance test. Now, if you're able to do a neutral and earth loop impedance test, you've got a big problem. You've got a big problem because that test shouldn't, in theory, be possible. But on a damaged network, a failed network, you can get a neutral earth loop impedance. And I've seen people go across neutral and earth on a system where it's been so poorly connected and it's just basically corroded in the street where you actually can get voltages uh, between the neutral and earth, which is quite scary, um, especially when you're around railways and stuff, because if you get that, you can end up blowing up equipment quite easily. Um, but yeah, generally as low as possible in fact zero really because they should be one and the same but um yeah you can test it you can test it in your boards you know see if you've got continuity between it stuff like that um yeah you'd, you'd have a big problem if you had more than a volt or more actually, than a few you know, volts between uh, neutral and earth yeah i actually have a different view here because now okay, we go for it. new standards uh, the Functional earthing need uh, a zero reference potential. And now the standards are saying uh, the functional earthing has to be separate from the potential, uh, the protective earth. So as a result, you know, the, the if you look at the ISO 30129, more information can be found. But uh, here, the, the Indian context, the problem is uh, everybody wanted to have less than one volt between neutral and the earth. Then my question is, if you have a IT system, between the distributed neutral and the earth, uh, probably the voltage is uh, 150. Still, the system works. And the system has to work, especially in hospitals, for example. So, this one volt is technically, if we look, uh, it is not actually applicable. There are methods probably uh, uh, derived to handle this question. Probably, I think we can have a, 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 you know, a webinar alone on this uh, subject. Oh, yeah, yeah uh, we could probably do 10 from these. Yeah. I'd just like to um, know, so the question that Dave asked, is there a test to identify if it's extraneous or not? I the, the, the value, the equation I was talking about was, does it need supplementary equipotential bonding? So, Paul, do you have an answer for, for the question that Dave asked? It's a 22,000 ohm test, basically, your wonder lead. So you effectively oh, go, you right. go from the main earth terminal and you go across all of your exposed and conductive parts and basically measure less than, well, if it's not 0 0.05, you can go between items. And if it's over or above 22,000 ohm, you can decide whether you do bond it or not bond it. It's in guidance note eight. I believe it's only a 10 milliamp current. Uh, years ago, we used to put like 20 amps through the earthing systems and see if you could see sparking and arcing from loose connections. But, um, yeah, there's lots of ways of doing it. There's obviously a 0 0.05 value, or there's your um, defining whether it's extraneous and your 22K test. I think there is a paper out there somewhere on it. Um, I'm sure we'll probably dig it out and do yeah. something with it. So it's just basically the whole human body resistance thing. Uh, yes, in proportion to it, yeah, effectively. Got it. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Uh, we have a question from Mr. Pavitran. For lightning arrestor, uh, individual earth pit installed, but uh, if it is connected to the other earth plate of the building, is that dangerous? Um, I will, uh, so by default, it, it can be. So depending on your lightning protection risk assessment and the system that you use, um i mean a lot of places now use like the rolling sphere method but you you can have a connection from the lightning protection strap to your low voltage terminal i wouldn't necessarily connect both the lv earthing conductor to the same pit for an electrode but i would run a bonding conductor to the earthing terminal from one of the straps to ensure that rise and fall in potential 
It's the same. Um, you can get, obviously, uh, transient surge protection. So if you go to a lightning protection company, yeah. they'll recommend, say, eight rods around a building, copper down conductors, and a surge protection, type one surge protection device on the mains, um, so that if anything does enter, it can dissipate it accordingly. But again, that's a uh, 62305 is a another specialism. Lightning protection is a specialism in itself, one that we need to be at least aware of. And if you want more information, go online and Dane do a red book, which you can download for free. And it has all of the 62305 stuff in plain English. I'm, I'm taking classes uh, for the last uh, 25 years or 26 years on this subject all over India. Maybe if I count probably more than 1000 uh, classes I have taken. Still, the problem is, uh, first of all, the, the question, uh, uh, say, for example, lightning arrestor, what do you mean? Do you mean in a distribution surge arrestor or a lightning uh, air termination system in a building? This is the first question to be asked back mm -hmm. because in the standards uh, regulation, uh, it is also, you know, people try to, the regulation says, uh, there is a mistake in the regulation, number 74, it says, uh, the lightning arrestor in the distribution system, it has to be connected to a separate earth electrode and then to the grid, uh, to the plate, you know. Uh, you know this subject is very, uh, uh, you know, complicated. But uh, Mr. Pavitran, as an answer, of course, you must bond. You must bond uh, with the shortest wire length. So, yeah, you can also... Uh, yeah. We we also have published a lot of you know these these books. Uh, uh, we can send you these books. Please uh, uh, have a look on it. Uh, but the, your question should be clear. You are talking about a building, or you are talking about the public distribution system. So coming back to the next question, Mr. Vignesh M, uh, IEC six two three six eight plus five point six point six point two. It says. DC, AC or DC and the test voltage shall not exceed 12 volt, which will be more stringent AC or DC and why they have considered, actually, I am sure you are able to see the question, why they have considered 12 volt, why not 30 volt? I am not aware of this particular standard. I will... Um, 6.2, I think that's mainly because a lot of the outputs of those switch mode power supplies is 12 volts. Um, but again, I'm sure. Hang, let me see. One, six, two, three, five, four. Hang on. Hang on a second. Uh, da, da, da. Let's see if I've got that in my wonderful collection. Six, two, three, four. It's for uh, a AV and I information technology equipment. Yeah, well, most of the switch mode power supplies 12 volt output, aren't they? Um. But again, it's more than a question for the manufacturers. You may find that they they do. It depends on the make of the product. But I'm not I'm not familiar with six two three six eight anyway. So um, it's a question I couldn't really competently answer. I can give a view. Um, Twelve volt seems to be the output of most switch mode power supplies. But yeah, actually, we have to understand what exactly is the subject in a webinar. If you ask this question, we have to refer, and it takes a lot of time to refer and answer so probably, probably another webinar in that as well <laughs> we can uh, maybe he can write to us and we can answer on a, a later uh, date uh, so there is a, a question from mr amritlal the public network of residential small commercial installation the supply is by tnc tns or tnc in uk for new network Uh, well, TNC generally is frowned upon. Uh, TNC actually refers to the supply distribution anyway. So when you have a TNCS, it's separate within the installation because it it's really quite, there's a bit of double standards with this. So TNC is not uh, permitted within a fixed installation, but then the regs also say you can use it, but you have to meet a whole load of other criteria because it's deemed quite dangerous within an installation. It's always worth separating the neutral and earth. Um, generally, all of all the systems, all the wiring in buildings is always uh, TNS. It's, it's effectively neutral and earth separated throughout the fixed installation. Um, in some buildings, in risers of in the UK, to high rise buildings, they did operate uh, a TNC um, system. So the neutral and earth are combined in the risers for tower blocks. 
and then separated off. But generally, it's frowned upon. It's recognised it used to happen, but nowadays we try and keep it separate. Okay. So probably we will take two more questions and uh, close the webinar because we have, uh, you know, normally we try to try to make it to one and a half hours because after one and a half hours, really the participants stop, uh, you know, drop start dropping. So probably after two questions, we will uh, stop. Uh, the question, Mr. Uh, uh, Betridge is, uh, can we test uh, for touch voltage levels? Yes, we can. And he knows we can. Uh, we can do it with our test equipment. And I, I'm going to challenge Mr. Betridge to come on one of these webinars and discuss it with us. So most electronic test equipment, yes, you can actually use capacitors built into them to look and check for touch voltages. There are maths and formulas and books out there. But Mr. Betridge, we will, um, I think, I think he, we need to challenge him to come on and actually do a talk because he has my book on touch voltage testing. Okay. <laughs> which he didn't put in the chat, but I have a book on touch voltage testing and he's, he's got it. So, um, Dave, you're coming on. Yes. Okay. Uh, also, the podcast. Few few questions on lightning protection, uh, Mr. Sajid as well as Mr. Kapil Dev uh, Pandya. But um, uh, both of for both of you, please look into our YouTube uh, channel. We have uh, NFE YouTube channel. We have made webinars on lightning protection exclusively, answering these questions which you are asking. For example, whether to connect the LVR thing and the surge SPD together and all these things. Uh, so both are, both the questions we have answers. Please go through our webinar on lightning protection. I think we have six or seven videos uh, in our YouTube channel. You will get a lot of information. So probably with this, um, we can uh, we can make a conclusion. Over to you, Mr. Paul. Uh, so which question are we on again? There's another one that just appeared up uh, and it's distracted yeah. me. All these questions are regarding lightning protection. We we have uh, videos which is already uploaded. Yeah, I, I think with lightning protection, the one thing I've learned in my journey on lightning protection is configuration is key. One of the, one of the more interesting parts I learned is you're trying to arrest it before it gets in the building, and yet with a lot of lightning protection systems, that by bonding them, say on the roof, you end up introducing the faults into the building. Um, so it really is quite a. I, I agree with you. Um, Gopa, it's an incredibly in-depth discussion about the configuration and the risk to the building and what are you doing and how are you doing it. And uh, I think it's fair to say that I've learned in my journey that a lot of lightning protection systems are fundamentally non-compliant. Everybody yes. bonding everything together with tape and then wondering why stuff fails if there is a lightning strike. Yeah. It's about channeling that energy around the building, not through the building, <laughs> but ensuring that people are safe. So um yeah, I, I'm going to have a look at some of your webinars now on that as well, because yeah. it's always good. In uh, in our uh, IEC committee, TC81, which is making the 62305 standard, I am a member in, I think, in six working groups. Uh, if we look at uh, what is discussed and what upcoming standards are, uh, the, the upcoming standards are have, going to have a lot of changes and a lot of new information, in fact. Good. But whatever the webinars which we made and available in YouTube are regarding are from the existing uh, uh, standards. Of course, yep. you know, technology changes and always uh, there is a scope for improvement. Well, as I said earlier, that I, I've spoken to the chaps at Dane many a time and said, look, I really would like to see a 62305-5 for testing, inspection and testing of the system. So we've got a common product standard, but um, fingers crossed. Yeah. <laughs> No, we have an ad hoc group and we are working out on a uh, on an inspection uh, standard or uh, let's say 62305 part 3 1 uh, okay. so this uh, it's only it's on the initial days of discussion probably in the next few years these standards may come out i don't know the uh, the current position situation so with this uh, all uh, thanks to all participants especially our uh, Sincere thanks to Mr. Paul Meenan to be present here. I think uh, it is, uh, what is the time there now? It is uh, 25 past 8 in the morning. Oh, okay. So you started a day early. You I started... was up at 5 a.m. and I was in bed at 2 a.m. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. Paul. You also okay. told us to prepare this presentation. It's been an honor. Thank you very much for everybody listening. Yes, so so thank you very much for giving this information to all of us. And uh, uh, fortunately, today is the World Standards Day. 
and we discussed the subject which is uh, the history of earthing and bonding the correct subject for the right day so thank you very much mr paul thanks for uh, krish to be a part of uh, all the nfe programs also thanks, for all the participants so we will answer to your question uh, the video of the program will be uploaded uh, very soon probably in another half an hour or one hour you can find the video in our youtube channel so thank you very much thanks to all uh, see you thank Let's you very be- much cheerio